It is uh, just a little afternoon here, so we are going to jump in. My name is Dan Reinhardt. I am part of the Illinois team here it's a at Momentum. Uh, yes. So th uh, first, uh, just thank Thanks. you all for joining us this afternoon. We really do appreciate Thanks. the Bye. time. Uh, and more over to our presenters here today uh, to take a look at um, leaning into equitable practices. Just a couple housekeeping items. Um, as we go through, please use the chat feature to chat in any questions you have. Um, Michelle or Marianne, would you like to, um, I, I can triage those as they come in and if you wanna address questions as they uh, arise, I can do that or if we wanna hold them to the end, that works as well. Do you have a preference? Um, either one is fine. You know, if, if it's um, relevant to obviously what we're talking about at the moment, we can mm -hmm. go ahead and pause. Um, otherwise, we'd be happy to stay and answer questions at the end, too. All right. Very good. With that, all right, I will hand it over to you and um, we'll take it away. Hi, everyone. I am Michelle Anderson, and I have been lucky enough to be a third grade teacher in Oak Park for about 15 years now. But to tell you a little bit more about myself, I don't really wanna tell you about my credentials or about my teaching experience, but more about my experience as a student. So growing up, I liked school, I liked my teachers, I liked my peers, but it wasn't until fourth grade when I met Mrs. Horn that really the relationship started to change for me. And we started fourth grade, I was really enjoying the year, and then about halfway through the year, my grandfather passed away, who was really close to me and meant a lot to me. So I came to school sullen and sad and unengaged. And like any good teacher, Mrs. Horn recognized this. And she said, you know what, Michelle, I'm gonna need for you to stay in at recess today because we have to talk. And immediately I was like, ah, what did I do? And so we sat together that day and she put her arm around me and she said, you know, I know you are sad. I know this is life changing for you, but your grandfather loved you and I do too. And we expect for you to be the very best student you can be. And at the idea of a teacher taking the time to talk to me and loving me in that way, my eyes opened in a different way towards school. And she said, but I'm not gonna leave you without any devices to cope. Over there on the counter, I have a basket of Beanie Babies. And whenever you're feeling sad or you're having a bad day and you want a cup of comfort, I want you to go over and take a Beanie Baby and just rest it on your desk space and remember that this is a signal to tell me that you're having a bad day and something to just get you through. And I started using this practice in class and I loved it. And I started to change my behavior in class, becoming engaged because I knew of the love my teacher had for me. So I'm telling you this story because as a teacher myself, I knew when I got my own classroom, these practices had to be a part of my classroom environment, building community, showing students love, opening dialogue. And it's so important. So I share this with you today also because in our conversation, we're gonna talk about peace circles and project-based learning as a way to meet students where they are, to give them a voice and choice in the classroom and to really expand that community that you have within your walls. So I wanna turn it over now to my great friend, Mary Ann and wonderful colleague for her introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know it's been a long morning, so we so appreciate you being here with us this afternoon. Um, my name is Marianne Rayfield. I'm a, currently an instructional coach um, with Michelle. We've taught together for over 15 years, and I just wanted to thank her for sharing that story with us this afternoon because I worked with Michelle for so long, and I have been in and out of her classroom hundreds of times, and I used to always see these beanie babies all over the place, and I never really understood why these toys were there and she finally shared this story with me a couple weeks ago and I was like you have to tell it because it just um, really opens up the world that she creates for her students and why her students love her so dearly and why she um, incorporates all the things that she does. So my introduction into why I lean into these practices is because of also my fourth grade teacher. And my fourth grade teacher, when I look back in my memory, is about grammar school and all the things that, you know, typically come up for, you know, what do you remember and graduation. And the one thing that I always went back to was my fourth grade teacher, because in her classroom, we were always doing projects. And 
to be honest with you, I don't remember the math workbooks. I don't remember the science experiments that I did in junior high, but I do remember my fourth grade projects. And I remember this one project where we did a mock trial in the classroom and my friends and I afterwards could not get over how amazing this one student did at debating. And we were convinced he was gonna go on to be a lawyer or a judge one day. And then we finished a class read aloud. And my teacher was like, let's do a play about our class read aloud. So we did a play and we put together the script, we put together the scenery, we did everything for it. And then we put it on for our parents. And then we also were learning about weather and one of our classmates was like, well, can we do our own like weather show? And she was like, great. So we created a news station in our room with an anchor desk and we were all in charge of putting on the news every day with the weather. And I just remember just wanting to go to school every day and being so excited. And then the other thing was that she inspired me to learn about what I was interested in. And because of this weather unit, I was really interested in the clouds for some reason. And I wanted to know why the clouds move. So I did all this research. And what I ended up doing was publishing my research in this kid's book. And again, it was all because my teacher encouraged me to have a voice and a choice in what I was learning. And she inspired me to want to do that for my students 20, 30 years later. So that's why I lean into project-based learning. So that is just, we just wanted to start off with some personal stories to share with you as to why Michelle and I lean into these practices, which we think create equity in our classrooms and also empathy for our community of learners. So in the next 40 minutes that we have together, um, we're gonna go over just some group norms because we're all new to this space. We all work in different communities. So just for our presentation, we'll share some norms. Our objectives, what we're hoping to accomplish for both you and ourselves in this presentation. We will be using a Mentimeter poll. So if you haven't used that before, you'll either just need to pop out to another browser on your um, laptop or computer or your iPad, or if you also have your phone, you can scan a QR code to get into this Mentimeter poll. We're gonna lean into these equitable practices of peace circles and project-based learning. And then we will have a couple of breakout rooms, which we will get to talk to our colleagues here today because the expertise is always in the room. And then we will share some resources to help you get started on leaning into these equitable practices. Some of the norms for today's meeting is we would like for you to just be present, of course, and be open-minded to the ideas that you're going to hear, maybe adapting some of these practices in your own classroom. Of course, kids are always at the center of our conversations. As far as the process norms, um, we really encourage you to participate, to join in the chats. If there's an opportunity to pick up the mic, um, please do so and share with us your thoughts and feelings. Um, if you can stay on mute, that would be great. And also, I know it's hard, but if you could have your video on, it just helps for us to engage with you a little bit more. So we appreciate that. The objectives for our professional learning afternoon together are for us to all to try just to lean in to some instructional practices that promote equity and empathy. And then also just to um, learn just a basic overview. We're not gonna go into super detail because that would require many, many days and hours of your time, but just learn a little bit about how Peace Circles and project-based learning, they're going to support equitable experiences in your community of learners. So to get started today, we wanted you to participate in a poll. So you, Marianne's gonna go ahead and put that in the chat there. Or again, you can use the, your camera and do the QR code there um, to just give us an idea of where you are in your experience, okay? So we just like to know what your experience is with both Peace Circles, your knowledge about it, and then also project-based learning. So we could take a 30 seconds to go ahead and do that, maybe not even that long, and then I'll show the results here on the screen. Again, you can use your um, phone to hold up to the screen to the QR code, or you could also just click on the link in the chat room.
Mentimeter is um, just another way to kind of get either pre-assessments or formative assessments from um, a staff meeting, from your students. Um, there's great ways that um, the data is displayed. Um, on this particular one that we're using right now, we just decided on a pie chart, but later on um, we'll have one where it comes up as a word cloud. So it's, it's a really nice interactive tool if you're trying to get some data um, and present that. And thank you for participating. You can go ahead and look at the results there. It looks like half of us are familiar with P-Circles, but have never facilitated one. So and Michelle, if you click that arrow, you can also see the project-based learning. Great. Thanks okay, so great. much. So our, we're going to just start to um, share our experience with Peace Circles to help you try to begin to lean into learning about this practice. And we're going to start off with a video from Edutopia talking about how one teacher has used Peace Circles in her classroom. Before I started doing circles in my class, I found it very difficult to start the academic day. Students had things that they wanted to share that had happened with them, things they were concerned about. And I had a very long line of about 30, 25 to 30 students every morning wanting to share personal time with me. It made it absolutely impossible to start the academic day. After the presentation of circles in our staff development, I knew that would be the best way to have each student share and be heard in the classroom. Here at Glenview, every teacher holds circles for classroom management, for resolving conflicts and also to involve students in activities. Every day I begin with mindfulness to really get the students focused and centered and ready for learning. I'm going to need you to either close your eyes or to look gently at the ground. The next thing I do in circle is a check-in with a scale from one to five. This allows me to assess whether or not they're ready to learn. Okay, um, I'm a five, and I have a lot of things I need to get done today, but I'm looking forward to getting them done. Would anyone else like to share why you're a five today? Today I'm a five because I can't wait for Spirit Week. I'm a one because my head still hurts from Sunday. In order to keep order in a circle, we use a talking piece, which is a symbolic piece to signify who has the floor, who's able to speak. At the beginning of the year, I ask the students what topics they feel as a class we need to discuss. The students write the topics and we place them in the cup. Our next topic is going to be about stop bullying. How can you stop bullying? I think since most bullies bully through pain, you can try to see if you can help or make them feel better. If you see someone getting bullied, stand up for that person and tell the bully firmly and strong to stop bullying. Um, I like the idea of not being a bystander because that's somewhat being part of the bullying process. If you see it happening, and you don't say anything. But it takes a lot of bravery, a lot of courage to say, hey, that's not right. As part of a program called Restorative Justice, circles are also used to resolve conflicts that come up during the school day. Sometimes at recess, um, Sydney and Monty would come over and like just start talking about us and saying mad things about Janine. Is it your job to make Janine's job at school hard? Yeah. So you choose to either be the bully that you're being or to be someone's ally mm -hmm. and make a better choice.
Thank you. Okay, I wanna start by reading you this quote. Good relationships need to be at the heart of everything a school does if effective teaching and learning are to take place. In thinking about peace circles and what the teacher in the video is saying, for any learning to take place, it's so important that students feel safe and a sense of belonging and that they have a place they can express themselves in open dialogue. So just a few logistics of circle. As you saw in the video, children are to sit in a circular fashion. They are to have good eye contact with one another by looking at each other when they're talking. And they're really there to hear the perspective of others. I like to think about setting up a peace circle as the teacher is the facilitator of a dinner party. You're setting up where it's gonna take place, how it's gonna take place the mood in the room, where people are going to sit, maybe open some windows for a fresh breeze. All of those things matter at a dinner party, just like when you're having um, a peace circle. I like to think of instead of the food at a dinner party, um, the rich conversation is the food in a peace circle. That sharing is what is so valuable to the circle and to students being empathetic listeners to one another. A few important components are a talking piece and setting up norms. That talking piece, like mentioned in the video, is how students will see that someone has the floor. Even as a teacher, I don't talk in a circle until I have that piece to show I'm following the same rules and norms as every student in the class. The norms are really important. Just like we set up norms for this meeting and you set up classroom rules, norms for a peace circle should be created by the children. They really are stakeholders then if they're the ones creating the norms for circle time. I have three norms in my class that I let the students vote on, but it keeps coming back to the same things. And number one is we only talk when we're holding the talking piece. Number two is that we respect others' feelings and opinions and perspective. And then number three, what's said in this circle stays in this circle. And a student brought me that one and I just loved it and I've hung on to it forever because that's a part of that family and community and feeling that belonging in a classroom to know that what you say in this circle is safe within these walls here. We don't go to the playground or the lunchroom sharing them. The topics or guiding questions are often started by the teacher with low stakes questions. Things like, what's your favorite season? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? And then from there, just as all teachers do, is we scaffold and we add on and layer more difficult questions to get to know one another even deeper. One of the most powerful things I have found in doing circles, and it was mentioned in the video, is allowing children to be the ones who write the questions. My students just love writing questions and hearing their question read and answering that of their peers and hearing their peers answer theirs. Again, it's just all about that creating empathy in the space, opening dialogue, making it feel safe. Peace circles are just a beautiful way to do that with your kids. There are several types of circles and it was mentioned in the video to talk about um, circles for peace and community building and then also restorative circles, which is a different type. We don't have time today to go into the, all the different types of circles, but we have put some resources on the resource page at the end of this um, slide deck that you certainly can go through and click on the links and learn more about these practices and how to instill them in your class. And I'm going to share with you one story about a restorative circle that I have done in my class. But before I do that, I want to leave you with the idea that using peace circles in your classroom is a way to allow children to feel their equal worth. You want every child to feel valued and important, hear their voice, um, to really empathize with one another and feel like an equal. Um, each child has a gift and peace circles, having one child share at a time, deep, rich conversation really allows them to feel that their gift is shared and important. So I'm going to go ahead and share with you one circle here I am, that I did in my class. It was a restorative circle. 
I had a student a couple years ago who was struggling with his behavior. His parents were trying to seek out a diagnosis of either autism or anxiety. There was a lot of things going on with him. And one day his behavior became unsafe. He was throwing objects in the class. Kids were feeling nervous. We had to evacuate the space. I um, brought the class to the library. We took some deep breaths, we regrouped. And a couple of my students said, Mrs. Anderson, when we go back and we have a circle? And I was like, of course we can, yes. And they just wanted the opportunity to share their feelings with their classmates. So when we went back to the class, we wrote down all of our questions and we shared. And they started saying things that I would have never imagined, like they were fearful for their belongings in the class. They were fearful for my safety, for their own safety. They were worried he was gonna get suspended or didn't know what would happen to the student because of course this was their friend. After that 10 minute restorative circle, we were able to have a really successful school day. And that is the power in restoring that structure and community right away after an incident is to take place and it just shows you the value of this time and in letting students have a voice um, of course we talked about it again in the future when the student was there so he can voice how he felt as well but these type of circles are things teachers can do tangible things when you have your children to come over those moments so I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor to Marianne who's going to talk about how we're going to participate in a peace circle here together so oftentimes when we're in professional learning sessions, um, we do a lot of listening to the presenters about these great ideas. And then sometimes you know, we take our notes and we go back to the classroom and we're like, oh, what do we do? So we actually want you to experience a peace circle today. Um, we know that there is a lot of um, anxiety and stress about everything going on in education right now. So we want to give you a chance to share your voice and so we're going to go into breakout rooms in just a second, and we're going to ask for two favors. One, we need someone to volunteer, please, just to be the facilitator, just like we're this in your class. And the facilitator's role is simply just to get the circle started. And in this case, virtually, it would be just to call on the names of people so that people know it's their turn to respond. Then we need one more really brave volunteer to please just raise your hand to respond first. And we're gonna, and since there's only, I think 15 of us here, they're gonna be small groups. So it, it's not gonna be like you're broadcasting this to a lot of people. Please keep yourself on mute until your name is called. And then as always, just like in the classroom, you have the option to pass during a peace circle. If you are not wanting to share your feelings or your thoughts, you just say the word pass. So we have two questions that we are going to ask you. And the first one is just a one word answer. So I feel blank about returning back to learning this fall. And we purposely left out what type of learning. So I feel blank about returning to learning this fall. And then our second question, again, is very open ended. And this is where you can add some more detail. I can't wait until. So we're going to only be in the breakout rooms for about two or three minutes, and we're going to set those up. Dan, if you had those set up for us, um, just random breakout rooms would be great. And then as soon as Dan sends us out to those breakout rooms, we'll get started. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll do, looks like maybe three rooms. Yeah, that, that would sound be good. Great. All yep. right, awesome. Here and we again, go. Your question is, I feel blank about returning to learning this fall. Michelle, does your district have a plan for what back to school looks like right now? We do. Right now, they're they're rolling out the hybrid plan where okay. half your class comes Monday, Tuesday, and then the other half Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday is like a remote planning day for teachers. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. And the I feedback, what's that? I was going to say nothing is solidified, of course, but that's where we're at. <laughs> yeah, it, it changes yeah. twice a day at least, right? <laughs> yes. How are most families feeling about that? Are they 
or do you, do you have a, a certain percent of families who have simply opted out for one reason or another saying, uh, I'm not sending my student back regardless? Uh, we have actually a large population that on the parent survey wants in-person learning back mm -hmm. and kids in chairs, you know, five days a week. You know, it, it's a working community, like all of us working parents, you kind of, you know, don't know what to do with childcare. So yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the, I've been uh, having a lot of conversations with uh, superintendents, building principals, and they're getting... I've heard anywhere from kind of seven, eight percent of families aren't mm -hmm. willing to return to forty percent um, of of families have responded saying that they're not comfortable sending their their students back. So it's there's quite a wide um, spectrum. It's tricky, right? I mean, are you a yeah. parent yourself? Yeah, I've got a nine year old daughter. Yes, me too. I have I have three, and I my nine year old son's going to be in third grade, and. I really don't even know what I want for them, you know? Right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Well, if you want, um, anytime you want me to close out these rooms, I can do that, but certainly want to make sure that they, they've got enough time to, to work through those questions yeah. or that question. It's nice that it's small groups. Hopefully they're able to. Yeah. A little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love this feature on here. It's just, makes it, it so different presenting. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Coming back. There we go. Welcome back. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to close out all the rooms. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for participating in that, friends. I hope um, you found that as a meaningful experience. We just wanted to open up now after being able to experience that. Um, what did it feel like to have your voice heard among your peers? Um, so anybody who would like, you can raise your hand or you can come off of mute and just share with us just in however many words you'd like, just to say, what did it feel like to be heard among your peers? Hey, Michelle. Yeah. Just one. Let's, can we pause here? Just a, a quick second. It looks like some of the, looks like breakout room three is still maybe uh, chatting. So it looks like some people are still coming out of those and the, okay. all the rooms will close automatically here in about 10 seconds. So sure. uh, that'll just give some time for that, for those groups to, or those individuals to get back in the larger group. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. If anyone who's here now, if you want to throw that into the chat room, that would be great. Just what, um, what did it feel like to have your voice heard among your peers? Are you asking a question? I'm sorry. Yes, it is on the screen too. Yeah. When we came, when I came in, I heard like the ending. Oh, just the end of it. Yeah, we knew some people were coming back from the breakout room. So either in the chat or feel free to grab the mic like you are now and just share what did it feel like to have your voice heard among your peers? Well, I will share it again. Thank yes, you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Teresa from Chicago. Um, it's, it's always interesting to hear other people's perspective of, um, you know, what they're feeling, and especially their feelings about going back to school as controversial as, controversial as it is. Um, you know, some people are ready to go back, some people are very afraid uh, to go back, and I can understand all of those things. Um, and then as far as I can't wait until, a lot of people, is, including myself, uh, would like to, uh, see their colleagues and see their students and, you know, be back in that atmosphere and have cold.
Let's be over. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing some other things in um, the chat. Are, it was great to see people's faces and see their head nods. Just that affirmation of just a head nod is oftentimes all we need. Um, it felt good to be heard by others. It felt validating. It was reassuring. Um, again, someone else repeated it felt good to be heard by others. And this is the same experience we want for our students in our classrooms as well. So thank you all for sharing. Thanks. Okay, we are gonna shift gears here a little bit and talk about project-based learning. There's a couple of videos we wanna share with you. The one on the left here is something that I share with my students. I know a lot of other teachers will share this video with students just to generate ideas for project-based learning. You could see in the corner there, it says Genius Hour. Um, lots of times you'll hear Passion Project, a different name for project-based learning. So we're going to go ahead and watch the video. Again, you would show this to your students to just inspire creativity, kind of get the ideas flowing of things that they might want to choose for their project. <laughs> Okay, and before we get into more of the details of project-based learning, I want you to just hear from one of my former students about his experience with it. All right, Jazz, here's the first question. What did you like about project-based learning? So first of all, project-based learning was where you chose a topic and then researched about that topic, and then it turns into a presentation. And when you complete it, you're like, I did all this, and here it is, and share it to the class. Um, and I really like it because I know that when I'm done with it, first of all, lots of lots of kids and students like lots of attention. So, a lot of kids would want to be the center of the attention. Everybody's looking at their presentation. They're like, 
and are like, look at this, I wrote this. And they'd be extremely excited. Like I am, would be extremely excited. And yeah. All right. Um, how did you feel about being able to choose what to learn and how to present it? So I really liked that I could, there was a variety of things I could choose from. And then I just select one and then I do all this knowledge and I like knowing that I'm doing something different from other people, that different from others, and that I'm learning new knowledge and I'm expanding my knowledge on that topic. And it might not be some it might be something unusual that I don't even know about. How does it feel to know that you have a choice and a voice in the classroom? I think it, it's, it feels so good because you know that you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what that is. Wait, oh, I do know what that is. I really want to research about that, but I never got the chance to do it. Oh my gosh. Or they, they might not find, some people might not find it very amusing or they don't, they're not very interested. But if they do it and they start researching, start writing, and they get into it, um, well, I think it would feel really good. And having a voice is very important to a lot of people. And not having to be like, what to do this? Or you can't do this. Um, but I would like to be able to be like, oh, look, what, what's this about? Wait, what's this about? Which one to choose? So, that's it. All right, thank you. And here's just one more video of another student of mine. This is Caitlin, just talking about the best part of her year was her passion project. What do you remember most about your project? What I remember most about my project is researching my topic, getting help from the teachers, and being able to piece that all together into one big eye movie and showing it to my class, which made me feel really good and really special in my own way. So you just heard from both Jazz and Caitlin a little bit of what project-based learning is. And again, we're not here to kind of take you through step-by-step step how to do it, but just to kind of lean into learning about what project-based is. And so based on Lisa Westman's book and then our research um, that we've done on our own and conferences that we've been in and books that we've read, um, you know, project-based learning, it's authentic. It's what the kids want to learn about. Um, it usually addresses real world issues and um, more importantly, stuff that is going on in our students' communities and in their personal lives, something that's important to them. Um, we have the students produce a real world product. So that doesn't always have to be something tangible like in your hands that you create or make. Um, it could be something like a slideshow, it could be a video, it could be a podcast, it could be simply an email, um, like Caitlin sent an email in her presentation to Hillary Clinton. So um, it doesn't have to be a big to do, but just something for the students to share their learning and their new expertise and their um, area of interest. It, um, as it's assessed using real world criteria and what we mean by that is the standards that you're using in your school and your district. And most importantly, and this is what we want to try to lean into, is that it's student driven and that it's a platform for students to share their voice in whatever capacity that they can. Um, I know we have some people here that um, work with students with spe in special education and they might not be able to use their voice in the way that some of our other students um, use their voice, but there is a way for them to share what they're learning and what they're passionate about. And that's what we're excited to share with all of you. So go ahead, Michelle. I was just going to say, um, this book is really phenomenal. Lisa is a friend and mentor to both Marianne and I, and her book was a big part of getting started with this. So we really recommend it as a resource. Um, there's more information in the resource slide connected to this deck, but it's a great read to just start those conversations with students and to differentiate the learning in your classroom. 
So again, um, we would love for you to walk away having a little bit of experience. And I, and I know based on our poll that we have some experts in the room, so feel free to jump into um, any of the uh, conversation that we're gonna have here in a few minutes. But um, we want you to just experience a little slice. And I was just in Michigan a couple weeks ago and we went blueberry picking and it was so exciting. I saw this picture and I, it just captured me of, we want you to have a little taste of what it would feel like to have voice and choice in your learning. So to pull back the curtain a little bit, um, oftentimes Michelle and I are working with teachers and they tell us, you know, I have to make sure I cover all my standards. I have to cover all my content. And Michelle, if you can go to the next slide, we just wanted to show you in the slice that we're gonna experience here in the next few minutes, that it is standard based and that you do use your standards to help drive um, projects in your classroom. And so the slice that we're gonna experience um, is based on some work that a sixth grader might do um, and some science standards, literacy standards, and speaking and listening standards that this project could cover. So we're gonna do um, a little, what's called an entry event. And this is what you would do in a classroom. And again, as Michelle described earlier, there's lots of different names for project-based learning, passion projects, genius hour. This would be, you know, a really like a niche of project-based learning where you would introduce a project to the whole class. So this entry event is called Think, See, Think and Wonder. And we're gonna do a digital gallery walk. So in a second, if you have any kind of piece of paper or if you have your iPad or your phone next to you, it's just something you can jot down some notes. If you can jot down just a three column chart of see, think and wonder, we're gonna be showing you three pictures and they're gonna go by pretty fast. So but we just want you to write down what do you would initially see? So like right now I see a blue border, I see words in white. What do you think? So just again, a quick, like, what are you thinking about based on this? Like, I'm excited for this activity. I'm wondering what, and then what do I wonder? I'm wondering what we're gonna do. And then we're gonna come back together and we're gonna throw some ideas in the chat room about what we think all three of these pictures have in common. So Michelle, if you wanna just go to the first picture. And again, what do you see? What does it make you think? in wonder. Okay, and here is your second picture. What do you see? What are you thinking? And what do you wonder? And then here's your third picture. Again, what do you see? Does it make you think and wonder? Okay, so obviously if we were in a classroom, we would want kids to get together in small groups and share what are they seeing, what are they thinking, what are they wondering. Um, on Zoom, you can do this in breakout sessions um, so that kids are talking and hearing and um, learning from each other. And that's the biggest thing that we, that project-based learning supports is learning from each other. So just in the chat room right now, for the sake of time, if you could write down one word that you think that these three pictures have in common. And oftentimes this helps too with students who maybe were like, I'm not sure, seeing and hearing what other students are sharing can it spark some ideas for them. 
we have climate change, environment, environmental issues, concerns, environment, problems. Thank you. So it looks like a lot of people are talking about the environment. And this is where, as your teacher, you're like, perfect, this is going to lead into our driving question. And in this quick slice that we're doing with you here, um, we would present a driving question that is supported by what standards we would like to cover. And so this one, again, we said it was about science, doing a little bit of literacy and then presentations. So our driving question that we would present to the students is how can we manage shared resources for a sustainable future? And again, thinking about, you know, getting kids excited and motivated and being like, I'm gonna be around for the next couple of decades, but you guys are gonna be around for decades longer than I am. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of these resources so that they're here for you and for your children and grandchildren. So after you would do a driving question, there's a lot of different nuances and a lot of different paths you could take. But one of them could be for you to share some information that you have gathered for students. So here's an example of some issues that I have gathered about resources and then some just brief descriptions. And what we would like you to do right now is just quickly read over them because we don't have too much time left together, but quickly read over them. And if you know how to use or don't know how to use the annotate tool in Zoom, you go to the top of your screen and you should see something that says view options at the top of your screen in the little drop down arrow. If you click on that drop down arrow and you scroll down, um, Michelle, you probably are not going to have it just because you're sharing your screen, but it'll say annotate under view options. And then once you have annotate clicked, you'll see a toolbar come up where you can stamp. And so if you want to go ahead and stamp with either a heart or a star, what issue is sticking out to you or something that you think that you would be interested in? And as people are still reading through something again that I would probably do in either a Zoom or um, in, in school would be for kids to rank their top three. Because sometimes I might read these and I'm like, well, I'm interested in a couple of these. I want to read about a couple of these. So thank you. So we have a bunch of people interested in the deforestation and the Amazon, greenhouse gases, and then the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So then what we would do from here, I'm going to clear these drawings here. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. Is again, I would have already done some work ahead of time to provide students with some resources to help get them started. And when I experienced this project-based learning slice, we were able to go into the topic that we were interested in and look at these resources. And again, we didn't spend a ton of time. We didn't read the whole entire thing, which I as a teacher like have to get over. Like they don't have to read the entire seven page article. We just want them to get a little taste for what maybe they were interested in. And, and I have to tell you, that I did not know much about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but after doing a little bit of research on this and watching some videos, I couldn't stop talking about it to my husband, to my kids. And every time I saw a plastic water bottle, it would bring me back to what I was seeing was happening in um, the Pacific Ocean. So it just got me inspired. And this is what we wanna do for our kids. We want to inspire our kids to take what they're learning at school and it's their choice of what they're learning and they can't stop talking about it. They wanna go and tell everyone to, to the point where it's annoying. So, um, you know, I got all of these resources from pblworks.org. Um, they're a wonderful organization to help you get started into leaning into project-based learning. But we hope maybe if you are interested that you would go and, and look at some of these resources and possibly find out a little bit more about a topic that you're interested in as well. So we don't have time today, of course, to allow you to read the articles like you would with your students, but we wanted you to complete the poll just like we did earlier. And this time answering, what did it feel like to have choice in your learning? So imagine, and you did star or put a, um, something near one of the topics that interest you. Imagine that you did get to choose one of those to research. What would it feel like to get to have choice in that? So if you can go ahead and uh, scan that QR reader there, um, or Mayor, do we have the link in the chat as well? Yeah, just one second. My my uh, computer here 
kicked me out of our <laughs> out of our slideshow. One second. Yep. I'll put that in the chat room as well. And the great thing about this Mentimeter that's um, now you can click on it in the chat room, it's going to come up as a word cloud. So based on what people um, are sharing, what did it feel like to have choice in your learning, um, it'll just kind of gather all the words that you're saying. And you can choose up to three words um, to show us um, what it felt like to have a little bit of choice in what you were learning this afternoon. Again, a great thing to do with staff, a great thing to do with your students in your classroom. Great, so the words are starting to come in. Validation, power, value. Okay, I'm gonna head back to our presentation here to wrap up. Mm -hmm. And circling back today, um, we just wanted to bring you back to how we started here today, talking about Mrs. Horn, Mrs. Gulledge, our fourth grade teachers who inspired us so much to bring these practices 30 some years later into our own classroom. And it was all about how they created an equitable space for us and a place where empathy was present and community and safety was really at the heart of everything. So we hope that some of these practices are things that you can bring back into your own classes and thinking about about your own students and how this would be so impactful for them. So we thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much. And we're gonna leave you with a little song that we found about leaning in, just to remind you to lean into these practices. <laughs> Feel free to reach out to Michelle and I at any time. Absolutely. You and me in a battle and we're almost at the bottom and we're wondering what comes next. We ain't getting any younger, but we still got the hunger and the scare and the scope of death. I thought we'd do it the way we did, but we were just kids and we didn't know what we had. It's going by fast, got us all down just to get up, need to look a little more like that. Thank you everyone for leaving your comments in the chat. We appreciate it. If anyone also has any questions, um, feel free to either chat us um, or you can grab their mic right now as we're waiting for everybody to leave the presentation, but we're happy to stay on and chat with anyone who would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>